Welcome to our last module on semantics and pragmatics. Semantics is a study of meaning in the language. So lexical semantics is a study of word meanings and compositional semantics is a study of phrase meanings. Pragmatics is the study of language use in context. So semantics is the meaning and it can be standalone. We know dog, standalone is an animal, four legs. Pragmatics is the study of language in the situation. So if a male is being offensive towards a female, she might call him a dog. That's pragmatic. Compositional expressions are multi-word expressions that are predictable from the individual word meaning and their syntactic combination. So this is the literal meaning. Polly kicked the bucket would literally mean Polly hit a pail with her foot. We also have many idioms in English which are multi-word expressions that can't be computed from their component parts. So Polly kicked the bucket, meaning Polly died. For L's, you're gonna need to provide a lot of examples, context, and explicit explanations for them to be able to understand various idioms. There's different meaning relationships. We have synonymy, hyponymy, and antonymy. So synonymy is two words are synonymous if they have the same reference. So couch and sofa, quick and rapid, groundhog and woodchuck. Hyponymy is we have hypernyms, which is a broad term of a hyponym. So a vehicle is a hypernym of a tow truck. Dog is a hypernym of a poodle. Hyponym is a more specific term of a hypernym. So a tow truck is a hyponym of a vehicle and a poodle is a hyponym of a dog. Sister terms in this understanding is equivalence. So pug is a sister term of a poodle. A convertible is a sister term of a tow truck. Antonymy, we have different types of antonyms. We have complementary antonyms. So that means nothing in the world can be part of X reference or Y reference. So either you're married or you're unmarried, legally. You're either existent or you're non-existent. You're alive or you're dead. You win, you won or you lost. Gradable antonyms are opposites, but there's a middle ground. So wet and dry, you could be damp. Old and young, you could be middle-aged. Love and hate, you could feel indifference. Reverse antonyms suggest movement. One word undoes the other. So right, left, inside, outside. Expand, contract. Converse antonyms are two opposing points of views that require each other to exist. So one cannot exist without the other. So to have a borrower, you need to have a lender. To have an employee, you need to have an employer. For something to be over something, it needs something else needs to be under it. And in order to send something, someone has to receive something. Another concept in semantics is diactic words. These are words or phrases that cannot be fully understood without additional contextual information. So for example, could you do it for her? What is it? Who is she? What do you need to do? You need further information in order to be able to understand this sentence. In pragmatics, we have felicitous responses and we have infelicitous responses. Felicitous utterance is one that's situationally appropriate, and it is appropriate relative to the context in which it was uttered. So if somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? I would respond, I am a professor. That is a felicitous response. An infelicitous utterance is one that's inappropriate in some way. So we use the pound symbol to demonstrate infelicitous utterances. So for example, if somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? And I responded, I have a job. I have not provided the appropriate information for their question. If I responded, I love the color purple too, I have very much responded in an inappropriate way. Infelicitous responses usually violate one of Grice's maxims. So the first maxim is the maximum of quality. You don't say what you believe to be false, and you don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. Another maxim is the maximum of relevance, so be relevant, meaning I love the color purple too is not a relevant response to what do you do for a living. Maximum of quantity means you make your contribution as informative as required, but not more informative than required. This is a situation where I said, I have a job. That's not as informative as required. Now, if I went into details about my job as a professor, how much money I make, what my hours are, what classes I'm teaching this semester, when someone asks me, what do you do for a living? That's too much information. I've also violated the maximum of quantity. The maximum of manner, says that we avoid obscurity of expression, we don't use words or phrases that are hard to understand, we avoid ambiguity, we're brief, and we're orderly. 
in English, we have common speech acts. So these different speech acts include assertion, where we convey information, questions where we elicit information, a request where we elicit action or information, an order where we demand action, a promise which commits the speaker to an action, and a threat which commits the speaker to an action the hearer does not want. Performative speech acts are types of these speech acts where it, you use a performative verb. And they're considered as legitimate as other physical actions. So by, for example, by saying, I pronounce you husband and wife, I have performed a speech act. I have now created a marriage just by saying, I pronounce you husband and wife if I'm an ordained minister or ordained by the state. I order you to shut up. Whether or not you shut up is not part of the performative speech act. Simply by saying, I order you to do something, I have ordered you to do something and I have completed the speech act, the performance of the speech act. I request that you scratch my nose. Same situation, whether or not you scratch my nose doesn't impact whether or not me requesting it completed the performance of a speech act. We also have direct and indirect speech acts. So a direct speech act performs a function in a direct literal manner. You say to your spouse, take out the garbage. An indirect speech act uses one of the felicity conditions to not be completely direct and literal. So for example, your spouse or your roommate and you say, wow, the garbage hasn't been taken out yet. It's very smelly. This is indirect. You didn't ask them to take it out. You've said a statement to infer that you would like the garbage to be taken out. The speech acts in different sentences can be broken into further types. So we have declarative, uh, for example, he is cooking the chicken. That's a direct declarative sentence. I would love to know who is cooking the chicken is an indirect declarative sentence. Interrogative, these are questions. Is he cooking the chicken? Direct statement. Who might have the time to cook the chicken? That's indirect. And then imperative are usually orders or commands. These, it's very difficult for these to be indirect because of how demanding they are. Cook the chicken, that is a direct imperative. You're going to want to try the different practice problems listed and then look at the answers and see how well you did. Make sure to go back and read the chapter first. Do the practice problems before these practice examples before you attempt the practice problems for module seven. Good luck.